Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're looking at something pretty fundamental in industry, but maybe easily missed, boiler feed water pumps. That's right. And we're digging into an article, Boiler Feed Water Pumps, Guide to Types and Maintenance, 2025. The plan is to really get under the hood, understand what they are, and why they're so critical. Yeah, our mission here is to give you a really clear, kind of engaging picture, not just the what, but the how, the different kinds, how you pick one, and uh, maintenance too, basically get you clued up. Exactly, equip you with a solid grasp of this, well, vital tech. Okay, let's dive right in. So, what is a boiler feed water pump, fundamentally? I mean, it moves water, sure, but why should you, our listener, really care about this job? Well, at its heart, it feeds water into a boiler. Mm -hmm. Simple, right? But the boiler. That's the big thing, making steam. And steam means power or heat. Precisely. Power generation, heating huge buildings. Countless processes rely on that steam. So the pump is the critical piece, making sure the water gets there reliably. So it's not just plumbing. It's really about the safety and efficiency of the whole system if that pump goes down. Yeah, the implications are huge. No water or not enough pressure means the boiler could overheat, run badly, or... I mean, even fail catastrophically, it's serious stuff. Right. There's a quote from John Yang, a mechanical engineer. He called him the backbone of any steam system. Backbone, I like that. And think where they're used. Massive power plants, factories humming along, hospitals needing constant heat. Schools, too, the article mentioned. Yeah, big buildings. They all need that steady, high-pressure water flow. It's non-negotiable. And that pressure... The article mentioned over a thousand PSI sometimes, that sounds intense, like uh, fire hose levels. Oh yeah, easily. Mm. Which tells you something about the engineering, doesn't it? Definitely. What kind of build does it take to handle that? Well, you need incredibly tough materials, specialized alloys, you know, and really precise designs. These things have to cope with constant high pressure, high temperatures. It's serious engineering. Okay. So how do they do it? You mentioned high pressure. The article had a water gun analogy. Yeah, it's a good starting point. You put water in, you push it out forcefully. Same basic idea, just uh, w way more powerful and sophisticated. Right. So break down the steps for us. How does it work, stage by stage? Okay. Generally, three main steps. First, pulling water in. Hmm. It usually comes from a feed water tank, maybe a dederator. That's where it's treated. Okay. Inside the pump, there's this spinning part called an impeller. Think of it like a really fast fan creating suction, pulling the water in and starting to speed it up. So the impeller grabs the water, then what? Boost time. Exactly. That's where the pressure builds. Mm -hmm. The impeller spinning super fast gives the water kinetic energy, basically boosting its pressure way up. High enough to get into the boiler, right, against the pressure already in there. Precisely. Yeah. You have to overcome that. And for really high pressure jobs, you get multi-stage pumps. Ah, multi-stage. What does that mean? It means multiple impellers, one after the other, on the same shaft. Each one adds more pressure, like uh, the article said, extra engines to a rocket gives it more thrust. That's a great image. Multiple impellers like a team effort. And the last step, sending it off. Yep. Pump forces that high pressure water straight into the boiler drum. That's where it gets heated, makes steam. Simple enough. And uh, a lot of modern systems have smart controls now. They adjust the water flow automatically, keep things efficient. The article also mentioned preheating the water before it even gets to the pump or boiler. Why do that? Ah, oh, good point. Preheating is really important for a couple of reasons. First, it avoids thermal shock. Thermal shock? Yeah. Imagine pouring ice cold water into a boiling hot metal tank. Mm. Huge stress on the material. Preheating avoids that sudden temperature difference. Like not jumping straight into a freezing pool. Got it. Exactly. And second, it saves energy. The boiler doesn't have to work as hard to turn already warm water into steam. Mm -hmm. It's just more efficient. Protects the gear, saves energy. Makes sense. <laughs> okay, so moving on. The article talked about different types of these pumps. If they all do the same basic job, why so many kinds? That's a really key question. It comes down to specific needs. How much pressure do you need? How much space do you actually have to install it? Yep. Different designs suit different answers. Right. Let's go through them. First up was horizontal multi-stage. What's the deal with those? Okay, horizontal multi-stage. Like the name says, they're long, sit flat on the ground. Multi-stage means they have those multiple impellers we talked about lined up horizontally. Okay, and the advantage? Often, uh, maintenance access is a bit easier because of that layout. You see them a lot in factories, power plants, places needing high pressure where they have the floor space. Makes sense. Then there's vertical multi-stage, guessing they stand up, right? You got it tall and thin, basically. <laughs> Their main advantage is saving floor space. If roux is tight, 
vertical is often the way to go. But still multi-stage, so they still pack a punch pressure-wise. Oh yeah, they still use multiple impellers stacked vertically to get the pressure up. Just a different orientation. So, horizontal for access, maybe vertical for space saving. What about the third type? Mm. Stamped stainless steel vertical inline. Sounds specific. It is a bit more specific. These are usually smaller units designed for lower or maybe medium pressure jobs, the article said, under a thousand feet of head, which is a way to measure pressure. And the stainless steel part. That's key. Stainless steel resists rust and corrosion really well. So they're good if the water quality isn't perfect or for simpler systems, maybe in like schools or smaller commercial buildings. Okay. And the last one, horizontal ring section. Sounds heavy duty. They absolutely are. These are the real workhorses for very high pressure, often over a thousand feet of head. Think big power plants. So super robust. Definitely built tough. But the trade-off is they're usually bigger, need more space, and maintenance can be, well, more involved than the other types. Got it. So quick recap. Tight space, think vertical, really high pressure, maybe that horizontal ring section. And I liked the article's team of water pushers idea for multi-stage pumps. Yeah, it's a good visual. Yeah. And understanding these differences is like step one in choosing the right pump, isn't it? Absolutely. Which brings us right to that. Yeah. How do you choose the right one? Seems like more than just picking the type. Oh, much more. You absolutely have to match the pump to what the boiler needs. It's critical. So where do you start? Pressure. Pressure and flow rate. Those are the big two. The pump's discharge pressure must be higher than the boiler's operating pressure. Significantly higher. You don't go water in, right? Exactly. So if your boiler runs at, say, 500 PSI, your pump needs to deliver more than that, maybe 550, 600 PSI, depending on the system. Okay. And flow rate, how much water per minute? Yep, gallons per minute usually. That needs to match the boiler's maximum steam demand. You know, how much steam does it need to produce at peak? The pump has to supply enough water for that. Like making sure your hose can actually water the whole garden? Perfect analogy. Too little flow and the boiler stars can't make enough steam. Okay, pressure and flow first. What else? You mentioned space earlier. Right, physical space and layout. Mm. Is there room for a long horizontal pump or does it have to be a tall vertical one? That's a practical thing you need to figure out. And thinking about getting to it later for maintenance too, I suppose. Definitely. Ease of access for maintenance is a big factor in the long run. Then there's the water itself. Water quality matters. Hugely. If the water has chemicals, grit, stuff like that, yeah. it can corrode or wear out the pump internals faster. So that's where maybe the stainless steel type comes in handy? Could be, yeah. Or specific materials designed for tough water. Mm. And related to the water is NPSH, net positive suction head. Okay. NPSH, sounds technical. Break that down for us. Basically, it's about making sure there's enough pressure at the pump's inlet to push water into the pump properly. Why is that so important? To prevent something called cavitation. If the pressure at the inlet drops too low, the water can actually form tiny vapor bubbles inside the pump. Bubbles? That doesn't sound good. It's not. These bubbles collapse violently as the pressure rises again inside the pump, causes noise, vibration, and can physically damage the impeller. It eats away at the metal. Ouch. So NPSH is about preventing those damaging bubbles. The article said, like, making sure your straw has enough juice. That's a great way to put it. You need enough liquid pressure pushing in so the pump doesn't sort of suck air or vapor. Yeah. You need enough available head, NPSHA, compared to what the pump requires, NPSHA. Got it. Avoid cavitation. What about controls? We mentioned smart controls. Yeah, that's another factor. Many modern pumps have variable speed drives, electronic controls. They can adjust the speed and flow based on exactly what the boiler needs right now. Which saves energy, presumably. Big time. Instead of running full tilt all the time, it ramps up and down more efficient. And finally, always check local safety codes and standards. Make sure the pump meets all the requirements. Right. Like Tim, the expert quoted in the article said, get the pressure and flow right and you're halfway there. But these other things are crucial too. Okay, so it's a whole package. Pressure, flow, space, water quality, NPSH, controls, safety regs, quite a checklist. Once you've got the right pump installed, how do you keep it happy? Let's talk maintenance. Maintenance is absolutely key, non-negotiable if you want that pump to last and run reliably. The article compared it to taking care of a bike, mm -hmm. right? Regular checks keep things running smoothly. Makes sense. So what are the must-do maintenance tasks? Well, regular checks are number one. Just uh, listening for weird noises, feeling for unusual vibration, checking the pressure gauges, temperature readings. Like checking the oil in your car, catching problems early. Exactly that. 
Hmm. Early detection saves a lot of headaches and money down the line. Okay. What else? Water quality again? Yep. Keeping the water clean is vital for the pump's health too, not just for choosing it. Dirt, scale, corrosive stuff. Hmm. It all causes wear and tear inside the pump. Buildup can really hurt performance. So using things like deaerators, testing the water regularly. Essential preventive measures. Then you've got seals and bearings. Moving parts, essentially. Well, seals stop the leaks, keep the pressure in. Bearings let the shaft spin smoothly. Like uh, oiling a squeaky door hinge. Good one, yeah. Worn seals mean leaks, lost pressure. Worn bearings mean noise, vibration, and eventually the whole thing could seize up. So you need to inspect them, replace them when they're worn out. Okay, regular checks, clean water, seals and bearings, anything more major? Yeah, scheduled preventive maintenance like a proper tune-up. Maybe every three, six months depends on the pump and how hard it works. And what happens during that? Could involve cleaning the impeller, checking internal clearances, testing the controls properly, yeah. following the manufacturer's checklist, basically. The article had a tip about keeping a log of checks, right? Yeah, super useful. Track what was done and when. And that fun fact was pretty telling. A well-maintained pump can last over 20 years. Wow, 20 years. That really shows the value of looking after it. It really does. Okay, the article also hit some common questions people ask. Let's maybe run through those quickly to cement the key points. First one, oh. basic function. Simple. Sends water to the boiler to make steam. Keeps the boiler topped up like uh, keeping your water bottle full on a hike. That was the analogy. Got it. And the main types again. Four main ones. Horizontal multi-stage, vertical multi-stage, stamped stainless steel vertical inline, and the heavy-duty horizontal ring section, each for different pressure and space needs. Sizing. How do you pick the right size? Match the boiler's pressure and flow needs. Pump pressure must be higher than boiler pressure. Flow rate needs to meet steam demand. And check that MPSH. The article said it's like choosing the right size shoes. Gotta fit the job. Good one. What makes them fail? Common reasons. Uh, cavitation is a big one. Remember the bubbles. Also, dirty or corrosive water. Choosing the wrong size pump in the first place. And of course, skipping maintenance. Right. And how often should that maintenance happen? General rule? General guideline is checks every three to six months, inspect seals, bearings, check water quality, but always, always follow the manufacturer's specific guide for your pump. Perfect. Good recap. Now, the article finished with a look at the market for these pumps heading towards 2025. What's the picture there? It's a pretty steady market, actually, growing consistently. Why? Because we still rely heavily on steam for power generation and lots of industrial processes. So demand is solid. Any numbers on market size? Yeah, it estimated the global market was around $671 million in 2024. Okay. And projected to hit about $782.7 million by 2030. That's a growth rate of roughly 2.6% per year. Steady Eddie. Decent, consistent growth reflects that ongoing need, I guess. Exactly. Infrastructure development, keeping factories running, powering cities. It all needs steam, which needs these pumps. And where are they used most? Still power plants and factories? Primarily, yes. Mm -hmm. Power generation is huge. Lots of different industries use steam, too, mm. but also large commercial buildings, hospitals, universities, big office blocks using boilers for heat. Right. The article mentioned something like 12 percent of U.S. commercial buildings have boilers. That's over half a million buildings. Wow, that many. You just don't think about them being there. Exactly. They're hidden away, doing a crucial job. Any big names in the manufacturing game who makes these things? Oh, yeah. Some well-known players. KSB, Grundfos, Flauserv, Saltzer. Those are big global names. I've heard of some of them. Also, companies like BBP Pump, Ibarra, and Pump, DSMI, Carver Pump. Quite a few specialists in this field. So, a significant market, steady growth, major players involved. It's clear these pumps are, well, a pretty big deal in the background. Absolutely. Way more than just a piece of plumbing. Hmm. They're fundamental to a lot of what makes things work. Well, that wraps up our deep dive into boiler feed water pumps. Using that guide as our map, we've covered uh, what they do, why they matter, the types, how to choose one, maintenance, and the market picture, too. Yeah, hopefully you've got a real sense now of how vital these often unseen machines are for industry, for big buildings. Mm -hmm. They're this neat mix of robust engineering and uh, critical function. So here's a final thought to leave you with. Think about that complexity, that hidden, crucial role these pumps play. What other bits of technology, what other unseen machinery are quietly working away behind the scenes, making our modern lives possible? That's a great question. If this got you thinking, maybe dig a little deeper, look into boiler systems nearby, or check out some of those manufacturers' websites we mentioned. 
What else do you want to know about these workhorse machines? There's always more to uncover.